I guess it kind of goes back to sixth grade. I was building Lego, like I was like Mr. Lego. I built anything and everything. But in sixth grade, somebody told me that a mechanical engineer is somebody who designs machines. And I'm like, well, what else would I want to do? Like, that sounds perfect. Uh, and then a few years later, I started riding roller coasters. Like, oh my gosh, these are amazing. And then I was like, wait, I can put two and two together. You know, I can design a machine that is a roller coaster. And it's like, there's no better machine out there. So I started pursuing that, you know, growing up right by Cedar Point, you know, the wood coasters that we had were just not that stellar. Number one, I love wood roller coasters. And number two, I know exactly who I want to work for. So custom coasters was like the choice for me. And there was an opening. They were probably a little leery of like this roller coaster model guy. <laughs> like, wow, this guy's crazy. You know, after that, uh, custom coasters uh, closed, laid everybody off, and then we started the gravity group. This is our typical wood structure. The structure is typically made up of two uh, posts, and on those posts, call this pretty much a bent, is what the term for it. And to think about it as a domino, and you set up the dominoes, and then you connect those with what we call ribbons. So these ribbons, uh, these are horizontal ribbons, uh, and then back here there's a diagonal ribbon. The diagonal ribbon keeps the dominoes from falling over. Uh, it's highly important. Um, the structural members on the face of the bent, this is a cord or horizontal. Uh, this is a diagonal, or whereas our guys in the field call them dags. And then up at the top in the track area, this is where you start seeing the wood structure if it's a steel structure. Typically down below on a wood structure ride, this is entirely wood. So up top, we have what the track, which is right here, the, these are the track layers. Uh, it's basically wood layers that are laminated together. Um, and then on the top and the side, you have a steel surfaces on which the wheels run. Underneath the track, the support of the track is called a ledger. In between the gauge of the track uh, is held together by cross ties, which are these uh, pieces of lumber here. Um, the access of a wood coaster is, is nice because you can walk around the entire track typically um, via these what we call walk boards. So there's walk boards and then there's handrail posts. On top of the handrail posts are naturally handrails. So you can typically walk the entire track, which you need to do uh, during the morning inspection. You walk through the track, check to make sure everything's all nice and tight. And then, so yeah, so that's timber. Oh, this is uh, Kukulin over in Ireland. Uh, this is uh, Rorosaurus. That was the concept of that. That's our concept original car. Go ahead and build your one. Doing the test on. Yeah, yeah. Doing Corey, right? Yeah, actually, I think we were all down there at one point. Yeah, that goes way back. Yeah. I wonder how many times the picture is going to be for the tunnel. So here's our water dummy, Timberliner test dummy. You blow it up with water and then it folds up really, really small into a tiny little thing. Super light, compact. And uh, so for instance, when we were doing Park St. Paul, we sent uh, 12 of these over with Brian on the airplane. And so he was able to take all the water dummies we needed for testing as, uh, as luggage. So it's not really common for most water dummies. We used to use the hard plastic dummies and they caused a lot of cushion damage. And uh, that once we saw this, we're like, this is good. This is really, really, really good. This might be a bunch of all these broken tools. So we have two different wheels. We actually have the top wheel, which is our road wheel. Uh, and that's the large one. And then these uh, wheels down here are small wheels, but the small wheels are actually on the guide wheels as well as the upstop wheel. We wanted to standardize that. We actually standardize all the axles as well so that they're all easy to replace from a extra part numbers point of view. These are aluminum fins. Those are copper fins. So it just depends on the ride. 
and uh, what the design has when it comes to what kind of braking they're looking for and what the uh, braking uh, company has determined. Yeah, so we have a serial number on each of these um, parts that come in. If a park, ha park has any type of problem with the part, you know, we know exactly where and when that was taken. And also when they would go through the Chinese inspection, they actually have a record of every part on their train delivered. And so they can pull that up and they actually inspect the parts here before they even leave. Here in America, we trust people. We trust the suppliers. We trust their material. China, it's the exact opposite. We don't trust you. You have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is indeed good. Because we're standardizing on American, Chinese, and European codes, we have to do essentially the least common denominator. It's just a lot of, a lot of paperwork. So the Timberliner started as a number of different ideas. It actually has a little bit of history back to Lost Coaster of Superstition Mountain. That was a ride that was a conversion of a dark ride. And the park wanted to run a roller coaster through this structure but the structure allowed only a six foot radius of a car and there was no car out there that could do that anywhere close you know we we're at the time we were building a voyage in hades ravine flyer and we really saw a need for something that put a lot less force on the tracks we got to the point where like if we want to have these dynamic designs we have to get the force on the track down so that the ride stays smooth we started kicking around the ideas of, of doing our own train. We ended up settling on a single bench train that steered around the curves uh, because it put the absolute lightest load on the track and it totally exceeded our expectations. We also wanted to make sure that the passengers had their best experience. Uh, last I checked, people aren't really shaped like squares. And so we wanted to make sure that their body was contacting in a way that felt good and it felt solid and it felt safe. When it's a small person, the lap bar has a very tight radius. When it's a large person, it's a larger radius. When we were starting talking with SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment for the Sesame Place project, we had a 42 inch minimum height requirement. They said, what can you do to make it to 40 inches? If you look at a 40 inch kid, there's just nothing to them. They're very short and there's just no body mass and it's like jelly. And they're also four years old or even less. Their target market is Sesame Street. And so if you have a 42 inch height requirement, that's usually a five or six year old, they're past wanting to spend time with Elmo. Uh, we also felt that 40 inch was a good age psychologically that they know at least a little bit of what's going on with the ride. And so what we did is we tried all these different iterations on the lap bar shape and the cushion shape. Um, and we essentially said, here, here's a dollar bill or a candy bar on the ground. If you can get out, you can have it. And so we had all these kids squirming and all this other stuff. Uh, and frankly, we're not concerned about the ride forces on the ride, on the, on the kid. They stay in with our forces. What we're concerned about is the ride stops on the lift, the kid panics, their mom's looking out elsewhere, and the kids squirm in to get out. Actually, one of our engineers, Brian Kosmak, his kid, he was a pro at this point. He's been in three or four times. You know, he's like, I can do this. We get him in there, and he's trying his typical shenanigans. And uh, he's realizing that it's a little harder this time to get out. And uh, he gets to the point where he's like, <sighs> he just gave up. He just like the saddest face came over his face. <laughs> it was, and then of course we were like cheering behind him. It was, it was one of those that's like, yes, we got it. Hi, my name's Chad Miller and I am one of the owners uh, and design engineer here at the Gravity Group. After we left Custom Coasters, or Custom Coasters left us, and we started Gravity Group, we were just an engineering company. Uh, we didn't do any manufacturing at all or construction. We were that way until we did Grunelin in 2011. Uh, we sort of became a manufacturing and installation company overnight. Um, they pretty much told us they loved our design, but they didn't want to deal with a separate construction company, and they asked us if we could install the ride. I always knew I wanted to be an engineer. I, I majored in mechanical engineering and then took some uh, computer science electives and things too. It's not so much about the name of the college that you went to. It's, it's more about you and how, how well rounded of an education you got. And, and here we have a small company. And so when we hire an engineer, you really need to be able to do other things besides engineering. You know, we, we look for uh, creativity, uh, like in the artistic world, the, you know, stuff like this, being able to do these kinds of things. To, to be in the roller coaster world, you don't have to be the, the person who designs it. You could be the person who 
works on them every day, and climbs around on them. You can be the person who does accelerometer testing for a living. You know, keep in mind that you don't have to be a roller coaster designer. There's lots of, lots of other things you can do, and it's, that's cool too.